And here's the twist, right? Not just because probability dictates that you're not going to be the next Elon Musk. So it's <laughs> yeah. useful to get your, get your mind straight on that. But also because I actually think that the more okay you are with the life you have and with ordinariness and with not being a super achiever, the more sort of freed up psychologically you are to actually create amazingly impressive things, to really make a difference in some field, perhaps even to become a sort of one of these sort of stratospheric uh, gods of the civilization. I don't know. But just, you know, to, to think like, okay, I'm good enough as I am. I'm good enough if I don't ever do any of these things. And therefore, it's all extra, right? It's like a wonderful game that you can then play, sort of launch some cool projects and connect with some interesting people and take a few risks, as opposed to on some subconscious level, I've got to do this or I'm not worthy to be a person on planet Earth. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. At Traditional Medicinals, we look to Mother Nature for all her healing gifts. We believe that plants can do some pretty amazing things. That's why we use medicinal-grade herbs like echinacea, eucalyptus, and ginger in our teas to help soothe and support your body naturally. Every which way we turn, Mother Nature is there to remind us that she's got our back. Visit traditionalmedicinals.com and use code WELL20 to see what makes our teas so incredible. Oliver, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you very much for asking me. Yeah, it is my pleasure to have you here. So I actually came across your book, The Antidote, uh, Happiness for People Who Can't Stand Positive Thinking, at the recommendation of one of my former podcast guests. And uh, I I think as I told you when I emailed you, I really was intent on starting the year with you as our first guest, just because I felt that you had a very contrarian, but at the same time, practical view to the entire concept of self-help. Uh, but before we get into all of that, I want to start asking you, what did your parents do for work and how did that end up shaping and influencing the choices that you've made with your life and your career? Well, great question. I mean, I could, the, the first part is easy to answer. The second part <laughs> will just have to come to me in the moment. Um, I'm not sure I've thought about it in those terms. My, my uh, parents both retired now, but my father um, ran a grant-making foundation uh, in the, in the UK, uh, making grants in a whole different areas of, uh, sort of, um, charitable work. And, uh, my mother worked in a variety of different roles, things to do with, uh, housing, social housing, um, you know, getting, getting houses for homeless people, things like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. I guess, I guess now you put it like that, it, those are both pretty kind of, um, pro social, jobs if you see what i mean they're kind of um yeah. they're, they're kind of non-profity and uh and um community focused i have to say that's kind of i don't i think of myself as doing something more um slightly less i mean i hope my mm-hmm. work helps people but i think that it's i suppose it is a little more individualistic in a way uh maybe that's rebellion i don't know um yeah. i i was raised uh, uh the then the the I was raised as a as a Quaker, if this is of any interest or relevance. My, yeah, absolutely. My, um, and the uh, so my parents are Quakers, and the and the um, foundation that my father ran was uh, and is a Quaker foundation. And although I'm not sort of religious in any way at all today, unless you count being a sort of half-assed meditator as being a Buddhist, <laughs> um, then. Uh, but I do think that there's, there's a lot in the ethos of Quakerism that I really like. There's a down-to-earthness, simplicity, plainness as values, um, uh, sort of confronting truth and reality, and and uh, and a sort of uh, kind of a noble ship as, uh, aspect to to that whole approach, combined with I think a sort of hopefully a concern for other people. But uh, I, I shouldn't really claim yeah. that of myself. I guess. <laughs> so I mean, what are the the values that you were brought up with that really shaped this perspective that you have, you know, particularly on, on success and sort of the world of, of self-help and personal development? I mean, 
it would probably take my therapist to trace the uh, the the detailed connections. But I think that I mean, what I hope is my take on self help and personal development is that, like as you say, not credulous, not pretending that as individuals we can completely. Uh, remake the world and you can just sort of choose to become uh, incredibly wealthy and happy uh, on the flip of a coin with um, with nobody else's uh, cooperation but equally I hope it's not a kind of nihilistic cynical take like I'm I write about and talk about self-help the way I do because I do think that self-help at its roots is a is a positive and beneficial thing to have that, that we can grow and develop. And there are exciting ways to sort of manifest our creativity and, uh, and be more productive and be better in relationships and all the rest of it. All stuff that I struggle with, by the way, I think anyone who is in this space and pretends that, that they're not <laughs> in it because of a personal struggle. I mean, you know, everyone writes, yeah, well, everyone deals with stuff because they're, because they, are enmeshed with it some way, right? Otherwise it would be boring to them, I think. Yeah, well, the joke among my listeners is that every guest here is basically a reflection of whatever problem I'm trying to solve in my life. I remember there was a period of, of probably a good two weeks where, or a month where, you know, we had nothing but relationship experts. So, you know, somebody on Facebook said, Trini, who's this week's dating expert? Uh, <laughs> and it was true. I, absolutely every single person is a reflection of that. Uh, so one thing I wonder is, you know, what actually was the trajectory that led you down this path? You know, what advice did your parents give you about careers and, and making your way in the world? I mean, I think the truth about why I ended up doing what I was doing, which was, uh, you know, news and still is to a large extent, you know, newspaper journalism, journalism writing for for, for magazines and for and for publications was just the fact that, you know, a, a, a copy of The Guardian was on our breakfast table every day. And um, I had a sort of passion for something that resembled some, you know, ridiculous kid version of journalism from a very young age. I think I was kind of 10 when I was photocopying, making newsletters and forcing my schoolmates to, well, (laughs) not, not read them, but at least yeah. a- accept the piece of paper <laughs> and then, <laughs> and, and then uh, you know, I, I sort of followed that through uh, all the way up to, to university sort of doing, doing uh, sort of amateur journalism whenever I had the opportunity. So it, that's the route really. It's, it's like journalism. Uh, and then yeah. I, and then I sort of uh, landed eventually at the guardian and it was there that I started writing columns on this kind of, on this kind of material. So I think th- in terms of, family context and setting that is you know firstly uh the sort of value that that journalism and public communication is a is a valuable and useful thing in the world but also a kind of Mm -hmm. just the idea that like i could do it right that that Mm -hmm. writing stuff and photocopying it and trying to get other people to read it is a is a sort of you know that you should just sort of go for it i remember i always had a problem with uh the idea that you had to do things in a sort of a make believe way that you could sort of that you had to sort of play at being a doctor or a journalist or whatever i was wanting to like literally like make a publication and get real people to read it when i was uh when i was far too tiny for that to be uh appropriate and i see the same thing in my uh, four year old son actually he doesn't he doesn't want to play at being an astronaut he's like no i want to really go to outer space so I don't know. What, I, don't, I don't know what to make of that, but it's uh, maybe uh, it's... Call, give, give Elon a call and see if he'll let him on one of the next SpaceX flights. Right. Well, so so there's a lot of things here. For, for, I do want to come back to journalism in particular and media, just because it's been such an interesting time in media, particularly here in the United States. But uh, one thing I wonder is, is you know, why is it that some people have that inkling at such an early age, and somehow it gets nurtured in you know it manifests early in their life, and it doesn't for a lot of other people. Um, and of course, you know, I think some people would say, oh, well, I missed it. So what can I do now? Uh, so let, let's, let's start there. And also, I, you know, based on your accent, I assume you grew up in the UK. What differences have you noticed um, in the way that Americans are, are socialized, particularly in the context of growing up versus, you know, children uh, where you grew up? It's an interesting question. Yeah, I grew up in, in York in the north of England. Um, and now I live in New York City. Um I, I think that uh, I mean I, the main thing I, I, in the first part of your question is just that I think uh, you know 
my parents really did sort of uh, encourage me to do the thing. I mean, it's a cliche, right? But I think I, there was there was not a sense uh, that I really should, uh, you know, become a, a specific thing, be a lawyer or a doctor or to follow exactly in their footsteps or, or anything like that. Um, and for whatever reason that I still don't really understand the, 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 the thing that was there wanting to come out was, was doing, was doing journalism. It's kind of, uh, I've sort of evolved and adapted from there. You know, I kind of, I, I was in the interesting position of, of, of achieving something that I sort of had dreamed of since I was a tiny kid, namely a job at the Guardian, pretty young as these things go, which is both great and something to sort of hopefully doesn't sound too much like bragging. But on the other hand, it's kind of creates an interesting sort of a crisis as well, right? Because uh, the target is, uh, is, is, is removed. Like once you've sort of completed a goal, you're like, hang on, I've got the, I've got a career to figure out here. The, uh, the whole, uh, the whole way ahead of me, Britain versus America. It's really hard to know the difference because uh, between like kids being brought up in, in, in the UK uh, and kids being brought up in the US because there's also this big time gap, right? I'm I'm coming at it as a as an adult, uh, yeah, and you know, not not a not a super young adult either in um in the US. So now I see and share a lot of the criticisms of this idea of people sort of being having their childhoods just completely uh, sacrificed to like getting in developing having a rounded cv you know having having enough of a resume to get into the very best colleges and stuff and it doesn't seem like a great way to live at all i really did have a certain amount of um you know you come home from you come home from school and you're just sort of like wandering around the streets with your friends doing aimlessly kind of uh but actually in all sorts of ways developing your friendships and your and your passions and your creativity without realizing it but that might have been because it was you know the 80s or the mm-hmm. the late 80s the early 90s rather than uh, that it was britain um i do see in and then just the other thing to say i think just quickly i do see at least among sort of relatively privileged people in the us though i don't think it's limited to that demographic you know a very strong idea that you can do the things that you want to do that that there will be a way um it's a cliche again it's the american dream i guess and it's taken a yeah. lot of taken a lot of knocks and had a lot of setbacks in uh in recent years but you i think that is clearer than in britain i think there is something i don't particularly love about the overall my mentality of britain which is that you just sort of have to settle with uh settle for uh whatever you seem to have on the other hand you know a certain amount of acceptance in life is uh, is very useful and uh, important because some things you some things you can't change. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, I think it's interesting you brought up you know sort of parents and, and overachievers because I, I think you know, I remember the first time I started coming across you know all this work on high performance. You know, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Dan Coyle's Talent Code. Uh, and I remember asking Dan Coyle this. I said, you know, like as a parent, as, as somebody now, I'm like, oh, why didn't my parents make me find something that I could practice for ten thousand hours? And he's mm-hmm. like, that's the worst possible thing you could right. do to a kid. Um, because, you know, they, and he said, he's like, this is why you end up with these child prodigies who actually don't become successful musicians and, and, you know, successful in their field later in life. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that, that sounds right to me. And it, and what it brings to my mind is that I've sort of given you a rosy picture. I, 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 um, I have, uh, none but the normal regular complaints about my parents. I think they did a uh, I think they they are excellent people, but I did end yeah. up by the time I was sort of eighteen and going to college, like one of those kind of not a prodigy, but one of those kind of stressed out overachievers who is kind of it's the whole sort of fixed mindset thing, you know, this idea that um, I got really good grades all the way through, but I sort of felt like I absolutely had to, and I got pretty like I made myself kind of ill in a mild way when it came to university out of some notion that I was going to do terribly badly and needed to do really well. And, um, and then I did do really well, but like, was that worth it? I'm not, I'm still, I'm still not sure. Um, so that's sort of those sort of perfectionist tendencies that are not to do with wanting to create wonderful results, but a, this sense that you sort of 
you're just trying to meet the minimum level for acceptability and that this requires you to be a, a straight A student. It's a, it's a stressful way to live. And I, I think, you know, part of my journey since then has been, uh, has been unclenching that grip and being a bit happier with them. Um, uh, the ways in which, you know, you're not necessarily uh-huh. always going to um, make a sort of unbroken chain of successful results and you kind of don't need to and kind of that's not what people care about. So anyway. Yeah. Well, I think that that makes a perfect segue to actually getting into the antidote because you know, I, I see so many interesting things in the world of self-help and, and you know, a lot of platitudes, right? It's like, oh, you can do anything you put your mind to. I'm like, no, that's not true. I'm like, I could put my mind to becoming the best NBA basketball player in the world and I'm a scrawny Indian. That's never going to happen. <laughs> um, but what I wonder is, you know, where does this come from first before we get into the antidote? Like, why do we have this sort of delusional optimism that gets perpetuated? Because I mean, even Werner Earhart, the founder of the Landmark you know, Forum, actually told Dan Kennedy, you know, while they were talking to Barbershop, when Dan Kennedy said, sum up Est for me in one sentence, because I think at that time it was called Est, he said, it's simple. He said, we sell independence, but we breed dependence. And I thought, wait a minute, that's true of like nearly every self-help situation. I mean, that's how you end up with cults like Nexium. Right. That's a great, it's a great quote that I'd never heard. Um, and it, um, I did not realize he was quite that cynical about what he was doing. Um, or as cynical as that quote makes him sound anyway. I mean, yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, zoom out, zoom out to the biggest, the longest term historical perspective, you know, in ancient Greece and Rome, what was called philosophy was intended in some way as self-help. There is the, the idea that people can, through writing and thinking and taking a conscious approach to their lives, make changes for the better, become wiser and happier. This is, this is a very, very old idea. And I, and I think it's true. And I think, I'm, I think it has done that for me. I think when you talk about like what happened primarily but not only in America, primarily coming out of the Great Depression, a real sort of, and merging a bit with certain kinds of uh, uh, fashionable approaches to sort of spirituality in in Victorian times and stuff. You know, you get this kind of um, uh, mix of stuff that really hyper-individualizes the matter. And I think, you know, there's a sort of there's an economic reading of this, isn't there? It's like that. This is this is what happens to the philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome under late capitalism, which is this very very individualized idea. This idea that you're responsible for everything you do, that you can create any result, but that if you fail, that must be because you were thinking insufficiently positive thoughts or you didn't have enough self discipline. You can see how it would be a very cheering message, at least. Um, superficially in in times like the great depression when it seemed like the the structures the the bigger structures that that people could previously depend on uh were were crumbling that the idea that you could just do it yourself that you didn't need that in order to uh have uh, an amazing life would would clearly that would have a have an audience and i think some of what you get in the kind of self-helpy side of the culture today especially in a certain kind of silicon valley-ish approach to uh to personal development and and self-help reflects something similar right this is the time of the this is the era of the gig economy we don't nobody has um can depend on a on a job for their whole life anymore and in this kind of context there's something very appealing about the idea that we kind of don't need each other in fundamental ways uh and can just sort of go it alone through the power of power of thought Mm -hmm. yeah well i mean i think that you know sets up the next question you know so norman vincent peel who i'm sure whose work you're familiar with you know wrote this power power of positive thinking book and i remember listening to the mary trump uh you know audiobook about you know i think it was called the most dangerous man in the world uh, which is about Donald Trump. And, and apparently, you know, he was, you know, Donald Trump's pastor mm-hmm. uh, was actually the who officiated his first wedding. But it turns out the guy was entirely full of shit. Um, and so, you know, I wonder two things, you know, one, what was the the downside to the popularity of his work? Uh, and, you know, as a journalist, you probably have this really interesting lens on media and how it shapes the way we think about this stuff. Uh, so, you know, what is the because I mean, even, you know, people consuming content like this, I, I realize like I one of my friends actually said, he said, you know, 
self-help actually can diminish your self-esteem paradoxically mm -hmm. um, when you're sitting around reading this because you know, I think the the quote, other quote that comes to mind, I remember Tony Robbins in one of his first programs, like dissatisfaction is a gem. I'm like, not really, because if you're walking around your life dissatisfied, then how are you ever going? You, every Everything is basically an uphill battle. Right. Yes. And there's there's all sorts of reasons why. Yeah, I, I think that I think that's right. I think, um, you know, if you if you set your expectations in such a way that you can only ever be. uh that you, that, that you can either you're either disappointed or you're at least not there yet then there can never be any kind of contentment i mean i think it's important to say as well that there is something legitimately empowering at the at the root of some of these things you know at the, i was talking about the great depression um and you know this is the context after which books like how to win friends and influence people start to get um start to get popular i'm i'm forgetting the dates i think norman vincent peel is a little later than all of that yeah but, um you know this this it, it's not worthless to say to people who are on some level uh feeling powerless that that you can that you can take uh that you can seize the initiative in your life i mm -hmm. think the 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 problem is the various sort of reasons why this always turns into totally counterproductive uh over promising and i've read that uh, the mary trump book too and i think that um you know there's a very she she gives a very good sort of it's basically a psychoanalytic reading of 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 why donald trump is the way he is why he considers um uh, professional failure prospect of professional failure to be uh synonymous with like death and uh mm -hmm. and you know what kinds of unconditional love were withheld from him as a as a small child, if you go too far down this road, you suddenly start empathizing with him. <laughs> it's a very scary experience. Yeah. But but you know, everyone was a everyone was a three year old once, and they were either being uh, accepted and loved by the people around them, or they were being sent the message that love was dependent on certain kinds of uh, uh, external achievements, and it would be withheld if they uh, if they didn't do them. So um, yeah. I think that's all. It all hangs. Uh, together but yeah i think also there's now tons of research i write a little bit about it in in the book uh that uh if you've got low self-esteem and you start saying sort of unrealistically positive uh, affirmations to yourself about wow. how actually you're incredibly rich and not uh and not feeling uh and not feeling depressed or whatever that um that this sets up a conflict a mental conflict where you just start sort of arguing against yourself and uh, you end up feeling uh you end up feeling even worse yeah yeah. So let's talk about being powerless because, you know, your people are, are hearing this at the very beginning of the new year. And of course, people feel like they have this sort of blank slate. And one of the things you say early on in the book is for a civilization so fixated on achieving happiness, we seem remarkably incompetent at the task. One of the best known general findings of the science of happiness has been the discovery that countless that the countless advantages of modern life have done so little to lift our collective mood. And so I want to start by looking at depression first. I you know, one, how do you end up in this situation? Like, how do people get out of this sort of depths of depression and the darkness of it? I mean, it, it took me, you know, three years. It was, you know, reading books, some of which did absolutely nothing, which made me feel worse about my life mm -hmm. um, because there was this constant comparison. But, you know, if a person listening to this is depressed, you know, based on your work, what is the first thing that you would say to them? Well, bearing in mind that I, I am fortunate not to have personal experience of severe depression. I'm more of an, I'm on the anxiety end of the scale, so I can probably talk yeah. more about having that. But, but, uh, but I, but you know, I think um, I, a few of us have, have no uh, experience. Um, and also given that I think the answer to the question really is to seek out, you know, good therapy and counseling and, uh, and uh, not to rely on, uh, random the thoughts of random journalists but but with all that uh to one side I, I think what's interesting here is that uh it it seems pretty clear that um the sort of the the, the kind of positive thinking that 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 sees depression fundamentally as a, as as a matter of feeling sad which you should then try to alter by changing your thoughts into happy ones is uh is kind of doomed to fail not just because you can't make yourself feel happy, but also because depression seems to 
be more sort of abs- feeling of the absence of meaning than the absence of mm. happiness and that actually all sorts of approaches that that sort of start by acknowledging that negative feelings are present that they're not going to kill you that they are negative that they can't just be changed with the click of a finger into positive ones um these are the ones that sort of these are the approaches that 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 leave you then capable of you know taking the next step i think the ones that say yeah i do feel this way and yeah i do think that things are not how i want them to be in my life and i'm not trying to sort of pretend otherwise i think that's what acceptance really means right not resignation to your circumstances like you're never going to change them but acceptance yeah. that things are as they are uh right now um and that you know there's no need to try to uh pretend that they that they aren't uh, say one other thing on that i've been uh really uh helped in my life by um a question that came comes up in the work of james hollis who's a jungian psychotherapist whose books i would definitely uh re- recommend and he he recommends asking this question you know what direction in life right now would would enlarge me rather than diminish me in other words not what would make me happier uh, because that's yeah. very difficult to tell and it usually doesn't work but but to connect to this question of meaning and to and to find, uh, you know, in whatever emotional situation you find yourself, something, just the next thing that you could do, however small, that would be kind of, that, that, would, that would make you into a slightly, that would be growth focused instead of, instead of sort of uh, diminishment uh, focused. Yeah. And it might be kind of, it might be kind of nothing. I mean, I know, um, uh, I think there are good reasons why uh Jordan Peterson is very controversial and has a lot of and has a lot of critics but I think that that focus on you know just do one thing if you if you can if the only thing you can do right now is to like make your bed and then mm-hmm. then reward yourself with a with a you know uh chocolate treat for having done that you know that counts that is that is real that sort of what is the one right next right thing that you could do right now um and that doesn't connect you to questions of like how can i make myself full of good cheer like that's not relevant yeah. there right it's it's like what is the next step in the darkness rather than uh, uh and it, and it, yeah it absolutely might be that you can load the dishwasher or if you're not in yeah. that kind of rut it might be that you can you know answer some a bunch of emails so you're no longer so overwhelmed by email you know whatever you know it depends where it depends where it finds you Mm. so you may be the one person who might be able to give me an answer to this question because um i've asked it to numerous people and nobody seems to have an answer that i'm satisfied with so i i looked at personal (laughs) development (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) not at all um it's just based on your perspective i feel like you might have some insight on this that nobody has been able to give me but you know like if you look at sort of a typical personal development effort whether it's a book a seminar you know whatever it is or a course you know i mean and you see this across the board uh you get sort of three groups of people right the person who would have gotten the result whether they went to that thing or not or did that thing or not because that's just how they're wired the person who actually that thing becomes a catalyst for their change and then you have you know sort of this um other group which is basically people who go from seminar to seminar book to book like i always said you know if i actually implemented all of the advice i've received from my podcast guests and the books that are on my shelf i'd be a billionaire with a six pack and a harem of women and i'm none of those things <laughs> you know um so like why do we get those three groups because I, I feel like that third group is literally the one that builds the industry yeah it's very interesting i mean i i I do think there is some, there are charlatans, right? There is real cynicism and the Werner Erhardt quote that you mentioned sort of, sort of points to that. There are people who are, who are just out to kind of, you know, you make a big promise, but you can't completely deliver on it because that would be a disaster for your business model, right? I mean, you've got to keep people yeah. um, dissatisfied. But I don't think that cynicism and charlatanism completely explains that problem. One thing that I think, certainly explains the problem and that I have, I feel like I have been, I've been there completely as a reader and consumer of this stuff 
is this mistake, and we could talk about where the mistake comes from, but this mistake that new information is the thing that is going to make all the difference. I am still to this day on some level completely convinced that the next sort of productivity book I read is going to provide the specific (laughs) system, right, the specific system for organizing my to-do list that is going to make all the difference to my productivity and creativity. And and naturally, if, if what you think is that more information is is what you need, then then that's a very understandable reason to consume more books and courses and, and everything. Uh, but you can see where I'm going with this. I think that you know, very yeah. often it isn't uh, new information that we need. And in fact, uh, probably the most important things that anyone can do to sort of build a more meaningful uh, life, uh, they already like absolutely know. Um, on an intellectual level and it is a question of finding different ways of um of sort of making that uh, making it a habit uh making it a sort of an, a perspective shift on the level of one's emotions uh sort of learning to kind of let this idea seep into you but it's not like you need mm-hmm. a new idea um like either of us right now could list the sort of five six things that people ought to have in their lives to feel uh as fulfilled and happy as possible whether it's you know uh good good social uh relationships physical exercise time spent in nature you know enough sleep it's uh it's it's not it's not hard (laughs) except it is at traditional medicinals we look to mother nature for all her healing gifts we believe that plants can do some pretty amazing things That's why we use medicinal-grade herbs like echinacea, eucalyptus, and ginger in our teas to help soothe and support your body naturally. Every which way we turn, Mother Nature is there to remind us that she's got our back. Visit traditionalmedicinals.com and use code WELL20 to see what makes our teas so incredible. So you know, I, I want to ask you a question about spiritual bypassing. So I, you know, I I moved to Colorado from a town called Encinitas, you know, and I remember the first time, you know, first few weeks I moved there, I was there because I was a surfer. But it turns out that it's like this, just you know, um, it's like the mecca of New Age bullshit, uh, and which I, you know, that's what I refer to it as. Although my my roommates like, dude, even your own work falls into that category. I was like, yes, I'm aware of this, <laughs> yes, but yes. I mean, it really is like to the point where I remember the first time I saw, you know, the Conscious Community Facebook group, which I'm sure I'll probably piss off a few people if they're members of that. I remember I called my friend Charmaine and I said, can you explain to me what it means to be conscious? Because based on the posts that I'm reading here, I think these people are out of fucking touch with reality. <laughs> um, so that is my understanding. But like, so, you know, you get a lot of this new age spiritual bypassing. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, crystals and candles. Like I literally said, you know, people are like, what's sense in this? Like, I'm like, it's a town full of white people who wish they were Indian. Um, they're more Indian than I am. You know, like they all have Sanskrit tattoos. They're vegan. And I'm like, oh, let's go eat at a steakhouse. Like, that's just weird to me. So why is it that we we have this sort of mix up of causation and correlation? Like you see this, like you literally see people who post, you know, pictures of gods of religions that they don't actually know anything about and somehow associate it with. And of course, like, you know, hundreds of comments follow and people are like, oh yeah, of course. I'm like, wait a minute, you're not even a person who knows anything about this religion. Um, So where do we get this sort of mix up of causation and correlation with new age bullshit and success? That's really interesting. And spiritual bypassing, your listeners may be well familiar, but it seems like it might be worth a quick uh, sort of definition. The idea of, uh, for me anyway, the idea of using spiritual practices and this idea that you're going to sort of become one with a cosmic consciousness to kind of avoid slightly more mundane personal like issues that you probably should get probably should be talking to a therapist about or um or you know at least you know uh paying some attention to rather than just sort of thinking that you can uh, bypass it all by by merging with the the universal and then i think that's very i think that's very prevalent i think it's more prevalent than people realize i think a lot of american anglo sort of meditation culture is that actually uh and i think it has been for me in the past you know this idea that like i don't need to worry about all the sort of issues and hang-ups and neuroses i could be working out because what i'm going to do is just uh you know um transcend my ego and then none of of it's going to matter um but then you also raise this other sort of related point of like is the idea that 
that by having the same like crystals that look the same as the as the person who has uh, achieved some measure of of um spiritual peace i'm going to get it from the from the crystal or from sort of uh, adopting the the lifestyle i mean i think you know the the it's okay to some extent to adopt whatever lifestyle you want. The big issue there, of course, is that is that it becomes, you know, any idea that you are pursuing one of these spiritual paths that involves at least loosening the grip of the ego is kind of undermined by the idea that what you're doing is building up uh, a really firm and forceful ego as a sort of super spiritual person, um, as someone who is like, you know, I'm I'm so, uh, uh, you know, if, if you're so sort of, uh, um, you're so sort of past, you, you've gone so far beyond the self that you have to keep decorating yourself with expensive new clothes and trinkets, <laughs> you know, something, something's, something's gone wrong. And uh, the sort of the meditation teachers and people who I know personally, who impress me the most, uh, they're not like that. They're living, you know, in yeah. many cases, very ordinary looking uh lives because like learning to be part of the ordinary world is on some level is like the whole challenge right instead of trying to find a sort of aesthetic uh path yeah out of it yeah. i'm not sure well, that boulder is a good move if you want to avoid if you want to leave um, <laughs> well no see, the funny thing this. is well for, fortunately here we're, <laughs> we're quarantined so we're not and, and here they have this sort of bizarre balance of sort of the you know wealthy entrepreneurs combined with you know naropa university so we right. have you know at least some semblance of balance here <laughs> um you know and i'm sure i've probably pissed off everybody who lives in encinitas <laughs> and lost some subscribers because of this but you know that's the price you pay for <laughs> having an opinion um so let, let's talk about the, you know, two, two ideas. You talk about ceaseless optimism and hedonic adaptation. And so one of the things you say is ceaseless optimism about the future only makes a greater shock when things go wrong by fighting to maintain only positive beliefs about the future. The positive thinker ends up being less prepared, more acu acutely distressed when things eventually happen that he can't persuade himself to believe are good. And you go, you know, you go on to say that psychologists have long agreed that one of the greatest enemies of human happiness is hedonic adaptation, the predictable and frustrating way in which any new source of pleasure we obtain, whether it is as minor as a new piece of electronic gadgetry or as major as a marriage, swiftly gets relegated to the backdrop of our lives. Now, I, the, you know, the, these two things, sentences in particular struck me because I've been trying to find an answer to this question of, of is there a way to get off of the hedonic treadmill and can we find a balance between fulfillment and ambition? Because, you know, I, I think that you have to have some level of self-interest to achieve anything. And yet we've seen what happens when self-interest gets taken too far. Um, you know, we live in a world that's the byproduct of self-interest taken to the point of diminishing returns from, you know, our, our leadership in, you know, governments to our, you know, CEOs of companies. Uh, so how, is that, is there any way off of this hedonic treadmill? It's a really good question. And, um, you know, I think part of your question gets at this idea that you wouldn't necessarily want to completely get off it right i mean this idea that you make your life and the lives of those people you care about better uh through a certain amount of you know self-interest uh i think is i think is a true one and a good one i i don't think i would be a better person if my if i didn't want to make my life situation or my family's life situation uh on a sort of constant process of I improvement but the but the treadmill is the idea that you know in many many cases if you do that by moving into a bigger house you'll just forget about how pleasurable it is to live in a bigger house the one that always i know happened in my life very clearly was that i sort of i like upgraded the the quality of the coffee i was mm -hmm. consuming and and now it's just like i have to have that quality of coffee uh which is kind of sad right because <laughs> i can, i firstly it's more expensive and secondly i i don't get the the special pleasure of thinking oh that's really good coffee um so the first thing to say is there are there are some curious exceptions in the research, right? So so one thing that uh, you do not expect uh, to find, but apparently is true, is that uh, people who have cosmetic surgery, uh, which in general we tend to disdain as a particularly kind of superficial uh, route to happiness, that doesn't seem to lose its um, 
uh, it, it, its capacity to sort of lift their spirits. They don't seem to adapt wow. back down to being depressed about it. So I don't know what that's going on there, whether it's just like feels so fundamental to yourself when you like change what your face looks like or something that, uh, that, it, uh, that it doesn't have that effect. I think the, the, real, uh, the real answer for, for, for most of us, apart from getting Botox, is, um, is to do with a shift in perspective, right? The reason that um, uh, gratitude is so championed by sort of people working in this field, um, I'm not particularly good at uh, sort of keeping a gratitude diary or anything, but I think it's good and you should do it if you can, um, is because it has the effect of sort of calling your attention to things in your life that are delivering that are capable of delivering uh, well-being and good feeling and that you've forgotten about right i mean if you actually go through the exercise of realizing that like the tree in our backyard in the winter looks to my eyes looking at it now looks to my eyes really beautiful um it's like oh oh okay i've actually taken myself through the process of of seeing that it sort of pops out uh again and um and its role as a part of the backdrop of my life is at least temporarily um changed into the to the to the foreground um and sort of anything i think anything that sort of uh shifts your perspective is gonna have that effect i'm i'm often struck uh, i know other people have this as well right if you travel somewhere obviously we don't travel anywhere uh at the moment but <laughs> right. if you if you if you travel somewhere firstly if you travel somewhere where people's lives are a lot worse than yours, you you have some gratitude returning to your own life. But even if you go somewhere yeah. kind of, even if you go on some sort of like luxury vacation, there's always something to me anyway about getting back home, which is like, oh, great. I, li- I like this home. Obviously, if you don't like your home, this particular suggestion is not going to work. But there's something to do with shifting your location, shifting your perspective. I think just to be totally cliched, that uh, the sort of changing your attention that is wrought by doing by, by meditation uh generally does also help you sort of see things uh yeah. more clearly in that way that sort of stuff yeah well it reminds me you know I, I was in india with my my cousin you know i went there for a surf trip and we, we took a trip up to the mountains and you know my cousin was t- telling me you know the guy who drove us he said look you get to make in one hour what this guy probably will not make in two to three years you know as a, as a public professional speaker and i, I realized I was like wow this guy literally he does a nine hour drive up and down the mount up you know to the mountains of india four to five times a week and these are not like pleasant drives the roads are treacherous mm-hmm. like every you know one possibly involves death the guy has no upward mobility and when i remember seeing that thinking i was like wow every time i think about complaining about something in my life i always want to remember this guy you know to the point where i was like i need to get a picture of this guy because i had a picture of me and him and i wanted that on my wall as a reminder and now you've reminded me to make sure i have that um framed and printed it's like who is this random guy it's like well there's a story about this um and that that always stayed with me. Uh, so, you know, we're at the beginning of a new year. Of course, you know, everybody talks about, you know, setting goals, New Year's resolutions, which never work, you know, that kind of thing. Like literally everybody's mind is on, oh, I'm going to become the you know next you know best version of myself because it's the beginning of a new year. But you have probably the most contrarian view I've ever heard, which is why I wanted to begin the year with you. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I think that, you know, the person who you mentioned, Stephen Shapiro, is also going to be a guest. But you actually say two things here that really struck me. One is about attachment. So let me but let me mention the quote on goals first. You said, whether or not we use the word goals, we're forever making plans upon desired outcomes. And goal-free living simply makes for happier humans. That flies in the face of probably everything that everybody who's listening to this has ever heard. So expand on that for me. I'm going to expand by immediately backing away from the from that, <laughs> from that claim and saying that saying that I mean what what I think I unpack in the book as goal free living is it's certainly not having no goal in any sense of the term because as kind of human organisms we're we're goal directed through the day, even if it's just to sort of you know eat eat some food and get some sleep. Uh, mm-hmm. And but beyond that, I think that um, uh, you know goals in the conventional uh, self help personal development sense of the term can be absolutely important in sort of uh, in in a life. I think what I'm what I'm trying to say is that there's a kind of attachment to goals which 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 automatically places fulfillment of them in the future for one thing it means you can you know you spend your whole life 
struggling to achieve things, which if you then achieve them, bring pleasure for about a day, and then you have to set up the new set of goals. So I think what I what I think, and to a limited extent, I've moved on a little bit, maybe from from when I wrote that as well. Like I don't want to say I can't change my view here. Is that um, yeah. I think the well, the way to think about this is goals as and plans in general, right? Fundamentally, as present moment statements of intent and ways to help you organize your present moment and today in the most sort of promising and fulfilling way. Not these kind of shining things on a on a hill that uh, you're constantly waiting to get to. And there are a whole lot of other problems with that stance in life, I think, in terms of like how it distorts the other values in your life, et cetera, et cetera. But, but just as just as sort of navigational tools for bringing into being the best stuff that you can and the best feelings and the best product, whatever you're doing today. Um, And that's what I increasingly try to do in my life. I don't think that like sort of creative visions are a bad thing at all. Um, Mm -hmm. Things that to sort of steer by. But I also kind of don't want my life to be about like, getting to my deathbed and for five minutes being great I did it well and then like keeling over um I, yeah. I i want the fulfillment to be uh an aspect of the of every day of the process as it were yeah. so i mean i can well, it, I, sorry i was gonna say yeah. like, the new year's resolutions uh for yeah please i'd love to hear what you have to say yeah, i mean i think the problem here is that um I mean, setting aside the fact that New Year's Day always struck me as a terrible day to begin anything because you were probably up till like <laughs> probably up three, up exactly. three in the morning drinking, right? But uh, that won't be the case this year, I suppose. Um, uh, you well, know, I mean, we are at home. I've been doing that sense. almost every night. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I did that last night. Just kidding. <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> till one, of, one will have been up till 3 a.m. drinking at home alone. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah, I think exactly. that the, um, the, the, the real problem with that is the way that it encourages this kind of belief in a total fresh start that is actually really contrary to um, successful personal change, which is absolutely possible. And this is not a, this is not the advice to like give up and just uh, conclude that you can't be fitter or happier or more skilled or whatever it is. But it's this idea that like, there's something very philosophically odd, right? About saying, I'm going to be a completely new self this year. And yet the person you're trying to change is also the person who's doing the changing. It's kind of, it's kind of circular in a really kind of confusing way. And it's also just sets the bar so high that, you know, the first day you fail at some particular uh, resolution, um, you, you go on the usual sort of yo-yo cycle, right? You end up sort of like calling the whole thing off and, uh, and, and not doing it at all. I think that, um, a lot of this is kind of anxiety driven. People look at their lives and they say, look, I am not as fit as I should be. I'm not as happy in my romantic life as I should be. I'm not as successful at work as I should be. So I've got to change it all at once because I can't bear the thought of like accepting that some of these areas are going to be suboptimal for a while, while I focus and work on one specific area. And what I've come to believe really is that, you know, the whole challenge here, actually, a, a big part of the challenge of all successful personal change is actually withstanding and tolerating the anxiety and the discomfort of knowing about all the things you're not changing right so it's about saying like look this next couple of months is about getting a sort of basic exercise routine going and just being okay with the fact that i'm not addressing these other three or four massive life areas that feel like so urgent um knowing that i will get to them Uh, in their turn in sequence you know and and doing Mm -hmm. this in a serial fashion and for someone like me and probably you and a lot of people that's really hard to do precisely because (laughs) like you're so into the kind of transformation kind of idea but i think once you see that that is a kind of there's a kind of anxiety that's driving that usually and and actually you know it's it's probably kind of fine if i uh don't um change up my uh, exercise goals for January and February while I work on getting my personal finances in order. Like that's probably yeah. in the long run at the end of the year, I'm going to have uh, attended to far more uh, stuff that needed my attention in life that mm-hmm. way than if I had had this kind of weird plan that I was going to magically find 10 more hours every day from January the 1st to, to or, do, in which yeah. to do all of these things. 
So let's let's talk about two 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 other things here. Um, one is this whole idea of these like wildly ambitious goals, right? Like becoming the next Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or Beyonce. Um, you may have read his book. Uh, Will Storr, who's another journalist, I believe, in the UK, yeah. um, wrote a book called Selfie, How We've Become So Self-Obsessed and What It's Doing to Us. And he said that, you know, we're creating this cultural narrative of, you know, you don't have worth if you're not going to be the next, you know, whatever Steve Jobs. And he said, and it's so toxic, uh, you know, and people yet have these, you know, very, very ambitious goals. Uh, also, you know, to, to piggyback on that, I've had uh, Elon Musk's ex-wife, Justine here. She's a good friend of mine. And we were talking about uh, extreme success because she wrote this really long answer on a Quora piece that, you know, some some kid had asked the question, how can I become great? Like, you know, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, and, and Richard Branson. And, you know, Justine probably has a view into this that most of us don't. And, you know, her view on this was really, really eye opening. She said, people don't realize like these accomplishments almost come at the cost of everything else in your life. Um, and she said, I don't want to get all deterministic here, but I don't think that this is something that can be learned. It's something that, you know, is, you know, you're born that way. And I don't think the idea that, you know, you're born as smart as Elon Musk and you can't become that is something people ever want to hear in the world of personal development. But, um, you know, you have, you know, a view into this that a lot of us don't based on your research. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, couple that with the sort of, you know, vision board mental masturbation that also happens with the law of attraction. <laughs> so what's your take on all of this? Yeah, I think it's so interesting because I do think that, um, well, I, I have sort of three thoughts and I'll try to sort of uh, keep them uh, keep them concise. But um, w w one is, yeah, I think if you look at the lives of a lot of these people who we idolize, you see that the sacrifices they have wittingly or unwittingly made are, are huge ones. You know, this is the, there's a story in my book about somebody who sort of, you know, had set out to become a multimillionaire by age, I don't know, 35 or something. And had achieved it, but it wasn't really success. If you've sort of you've ruined your health and you've alienated your whole family and your your partner's left you and your kids don't like you, you know, it's like at some point that wasn't actually what you intended. And I think you see that pattern sometimes. Um, I think the other point is that and maybe this is my particular psychological issues talking, but but I do think that if you look at a lot of these people, you see um a, a kind of i'm not saying that it's bad that they achieved what they did or that have innovated in the ways that they have but it's been done as a way to sort of meet some kind of psychological need right it's not um it's not because they just were sort of hanging around and thought like oh it'd be really cool to like do some cool things it's like they they needed to like fill some void in themselves or something and i think a lot of people who overachieve become celebrities all sorts of things are struggling to fill some void it is amazing i haven't got the figures to, in my head but it's amazing what proportion of recent american presidents have had absent fathers and you're just like whoa something interesting is going on there that fuels that kind of the, the kind of level of energy and discipline and struggle that you need to 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 reach those kinds of of heights which is none of this is to criticize because we all have our hang-ups and our needs and our like holes inside that we're trying to fill but i think it is useful to remember that um in certain ways you know the person who is content with being ordinary is arguably sort of more psychologically healthy than the person who um who absolutely oh, yeah. needs to sort of pull off these big goals and i think that leads to my final point on this which is the perspective shift i'd like to suggest which is you know it will be interesting to look at, to, for anybody who's in the position of really wanting to try and pull off that kind of stratospheric success to sort of say, well, okay, what are my, what are my real motivations here? Why do I think I need this in order to be happy? Could I, could the key here actually be to be becoming more uh, sort of easy and okay with being, ordinary i don't say not successful but successful in a more sort of modest and achievable way and here's the twist right not just because probability dictates that you're not going to be the next elon musk so, so it's <laughs> yeah. useful to get your get your mind straight on that but also because i actually think that the more okay you are with the life you have and with ordinariness and with not being a super achiever the more sort of freed up psychologically you are to actually create amazingly impressive things, to really make a difference in some field, perhaps even to become uh, a sort of one of these sort of stratospheric uh, 
you know, gods of the civilization. I don't know. But just, you know, to, to think like, okay, my life is, I'm, I'm good enough as I am. I'm good enough if I don't ever do um, any of these things. And therefore, it's all extra, right? It's all like a, it's like a wonderful game that you can then play, sort of launch some cool projects and connect with some interesting people and take a few wow. risks, as opposed to like, I've got to, on some subconscious level, I've got to do this or I'm not worthy to be a person on planet Earth. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I feel that as an author, like it was this experience I had, you know, like my publisher's portfolio, which, you know, the other authors there are Simon Sinek, Seth Godin and Ryan Holiday, you know, all of who've sold millions of books. And I remember thinking I'm like the redheaded step, redheaded stepchild of this imprint, um, you know, and that it took me a while to get my head around that. So, OK, you know what? I am probably not going to be the next, you know, Ryan Holiday, Mark Manson, you know, whoever. And I think that when I finally came, made some peace with that. I, I was able to get back to work. Right, right. And then maybe become one of, you know, that, that, that's the other thing. Yeah, I just think it's like, I, I totally see that. And I obviously I'm partly just talking about a journey I've been on here too. I think, you know, I spent a lot of my young adulthood thinking that I had to do certain things. Otherwise I kind of wasn't, it was, I wasn't, you know, hadn't justified my existence. And yeah. actually it's when you're not sort of tightly gripping on your goals like that because you know that actually you're fine as you are. You don't need those things for validation. I'm not saying I've completed this journey to spiritual enlightenment, <laughs> but I've made a bit yeah, of progress. Um, yeah, right. Um, you, you are freer to just like, hey, you know, send that thing to that person at that company. Who knows? Like, you know, there's, it doesn't matter if, uh, yeah. if, the, if this suggestion for a really exciting project gets turned down. It doesn't matter if this publisher doesn't want this book. Like, it, do, it does matter on some level. Got to make a living. But it doesn't matter on the sort of like, am I allowed to, have I earned my place on the planet level? And that makes you freer and easier. It makes it easier to, to, mm -hmm. to send those things and to put yourself forward in those ways, I think. So I, I want to come full circle. Uh, you know, I, I realize there's a question I'd mentioned at the beginning about journalism and, and media. You know, you're a journalist who's talking to a group of people on a media platform. Uh, and as a journalist, how do you think about, you know, the role that our media consumption plays in our happiness and becoming more conscious about that? Uh, I mean, even this, like I had a listener once and I've shared the story before uh, who emailed me. He said, you know, I am sorry to tell you this. He's like, but the people on your show are so amazing. They're making me feel horrible about myself. And I replied back and said, I can relate. I was like, I've been there. So I don't take any offense to what you just said. Um, but you as a journalist, I mean, you're shaping perception, as am I, as a media creator. Yeah, absolutely. And I think about this a lot. I think about it primarily with regard to sort of like the news, the political and international and national news. Um, you're raising another sort of very closely connected point, I think, about how, you know, people in my or your position, by trying to share what's most useful, end up inadvertently giving this uh, uh, idea that our lives are sort of unbroken accomplishment. I don't, I don't think I've done that in this interview. I think possibly the opposite, but you know what I mean? It's like, if I, if I find a piece of, uh, if I find some, if I have some sort of useful insight and I write about it, and then next time I'm writing, I do the same. Someone who only knows me through my writing thinks all I do in my life is like live in, <laughs> live in this world of deep wisdom. And, um, and, uh, you know, sometimes I get wonderfully sort of almost embarrassingly nice uh emails from readers about uh about how great i am and once or twice i have shared them with my wife who is, finds it absolutely hilarious because she has to <laughs> she has to you know put up with all the other sides of yeah. uh, a normal human and so i think there is that risk just in the way that media works especially you know uh these days we have to sort of you know we want to try to make stuff that people that people that, that inspires people and that they want and then you get this weird effect. It's a bit like the old thing about like, you know, people only post their vacations and their weddings on Facebook. So you end up thinking all your friends yeah. have uh, are just on vacations and at weddings all the time because they don't post about just being sort of bored. Although they sort of do that too. Um, I think <laughs> the, 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 the fact that I'm, the thing that I'm really thinking about now, especially as I move away from, like I don't really do news type journalism anymore, um, is I'm re I think there are some very unhealthy incentives operating in the sort of attention economy on newspapers. And I don't just mean like bad publications that pump out 
uh, disinformation, of which there are many, but even very reputable, good newspapers, the, the most reputable ones, um, who are just trying to inform, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why they are unavoidably um, incentivized to create uh, a, 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 a more alarming picture of the world than is necessarily right, um, a scarier uh, picture of the world than is than is right. I've noticed that even during coronavirus, which, by the way, I think is a desperately serious crisis and a catastrophe. I'm certainly not someone who thinks it's like shouldn't make a big deal of it. But even these things that are legitimately very, very serious, there's an effect in the media to sort of spread even more gloom and despair than is necessarily justified at any one time. And again, I don't think it's because the journalists are cynics. I think it's because the the structure of how this is happening now and the attention economy is so is what it is. And so I think more and more we have a kind of person that part of self help now. I feel like, or the sort of responsibility we have to ourselves is is really figuring out how we manage our connection to to all of that. I wrote a piece uh, a year ago now about like this weird way that so many people seem to kind of inhabit the news cycle. I, I can't even express it any other way. They sort of live inside the news. They they um. Uh, and I've done it a bit too, right? It's like, it's not that they just think yeah. politics is important. It's like they think politics is where their life really is. And then their house and their job and their family and their friends, that's kind of a bit secondary. That's not like their real life somehow. That's got to be unhealthy <laughs> because you don't have, because you're sort of deliberately identifying with a realm where you lack control and you lack the ability to sort of make a significant difference on your own. So I don't know, I feel like there's some, there's, I might try to write more about it, but like, you know, there's, we really need to think about how, how to sanely relate to the media today as a kind of, you know, it's like something kids should be being taught in school or something. Wow. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I am so thrilled that I got to, to have a chat with you about this. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. This has just been so fascinating. Um, before I let you go, I know that, so I have one final question, but I know you said you have a new book coming out. I want to make sure I give you an opportunity to talk about it because of course we'll have you back um, when the new book comes out. So what's the deal with the new book? That would be great. The The book is, um, it's, going to be sort of next uh late spring early summer that it's that it's out um it's called four thousand weeks time management for mortals and uh it's a sort of um i suppose one way of thinking about it is it's an attempt to um help us get rid of some unnecessarily stressful ideas about time and how we use our limited time on the planet and also then to look at how, what are sort of um some some more constructive ways i tried to sort of take the idea of time management but then take it like really seriously like stupidly seriously in a way like the how to how to use the time that you have on the planet not uh, mm-hmm. not just sort of uh, you know uh, what's usually meant by by time management so uh cool that's i'm coming looking out, forward uh, to that next year yeah great well i have one final question for you which is how we finish all of our interviews with the unmistakable creative what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable wow that's an interesting question i suppose that it is the same question i suppose that it's the question to which i would answer that that um there is a sense in which uh, our job in life i think is to sort of become more completely who we are it's a kind of a paradoxical thought but it has quite a lot of a lot of people sort of think of written about it in this way and i kind of feel like there are certain kind of people I know in my life and who I sort of aspire to become who sort of, I can't put it any other way, they they more fully embody themselves and who they were and what they came here for, uh, if that makes sense, than than others. And I think that to me is the sort of, is, is perhaps a, 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 a criterion that answers your question. Or maybe not. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> as I said, this has been absolutely wonderful, amazing, insightful, hilarious, thought-provoking. Um, I am so glad that we get to kick off the year with your wisdom. I just thought it was, you know, the right you are the right person to kick this year off with, just based on kind of where my thought process has, has gone over the year. Where can people find out more about you, uh, your work, um, your books, and everything that you're up to? My website is oliverberkman.com. That's B-U-R-K-E-M-A-N.com. And I have there a, um, a twice monthly email called The Imperfectionist, which I just launched a couple of months ago. I would uh, love people to subscribe to. And I'm on Twitter at Oliver Berkman as well. Amazing. 
And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. At Traditional Medicinals, we look to Mother Nature for all her healing gifts. We believe that plants can do some pretty amazing things. That's why we use medicinal-grade herbs like echinacea, eucalyptus, and ginger in our teas to help soothe and support your body naturally. Every which way we turn, Mother Nature is there to remind us that she's got our back. Visit traditionalmedicinals.com and use code WELL20 to see what makes our teas so incredible.